Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harclyde Walcott. I've been asked to chair this, this session. Uh, and I welcome you on behalf of the Barbados Museum and Historical uh, Society to the lecture series. Tonight's lecture, The Impact of Technology on Cricket Photography. And it will be given by uh, Mr. Gordon Brooks. So our speaker, Gordon Delight Brooks, uh, was born on September 20th, 1939 and is the fourth of nine children born to Clarence and Elmont Brooks of Back Ivy, St. Michael. Gordon is the father of three children, Enrico and Randy, through marriage to Peggy Bledman, now deceased, and Dr. Makiba Brooks, through current spouse, Ira Waterman. Educated at St. Giles Boys School, Gordon Brooks joined the Barbados Advocate in 1955. He worked first in the stereotype department, then moved to photo engraving, but by 1960 had found his niche and lifelong calling in photography. For the next decade, Gordon honed his skills under the mentorship of Cyprian Latouche Sr. and Paul Mandeville. On September 27th, 1971, Gordon courageously launched out on his own and established Brooks Latouche Photography in partnership with Cyprian Jr., the company first located in Upper Bay Street has been established at Pine Road, Belleville, 6, 1977. Gordon's business savvy led him to become a founding member of the Nation Publishing Company when it commenced operations in 1973. And until 2016, he was one of the company's directors. Gordon Burke's establishment provides services ranging from port passport photographs to professional quality wedding, portraits, commercial photographs, and restoration services. But Gordon's premier passion and craft is cricket. Sports photography, cricket to be specific. He made his first overseas tour to England in, 18, in 1984 and his last to Australia in 2009 on the commission by the Nation Publishing Company. Brooks Latouche has preserved West Indies cricket team photos dating from 1982 and all the international series in the Caribbean in its archives for posterity. Gordon Brooks is the author of one book published in 2003. The book is called Caught in Action, which highlights the 20-year period between 1980 to 2000 of West Indies cricket photography. He's the proud recipient of many awards for sports journalism, the most significant being the Silver Crown of Merit, which he gained in 2011 for his contribution to photography. From a tenuous beginning in 1971, and despite the death of his partner, Junior, that is Junior, Cyprian Junior Latouche, in 1993, Brooks Latouche has been built into one of Barbados's leading photo studios and one of the best equipped in the Caribbean. To honor his partner, Brooks has retained the company's name, Brooks Latouche. Since his retirement in 2009, Management of Brooks Latouche has been turned over to his two sons, Enrico and Randy, and they're ably assisted by Kim Dwyer, Cyprian Latouche's daughter and longtime employee. With that said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Gordon Brooks. Thank you very much, Harkley. Uh, after that introduction, I scarcely recognize myself. Let me, as uh, protocol has been established, let me up front thank K. Hall for considering me worthy of delivering this lecture and allowing me to be in such august company. When I was asked, I readily consented as I realized it would give me not only the opportunity to share my experiences with you but also allow me to re 
live some very pleasant memories. The Chambers Dictionary describes technology as the practice of any or all of the applied scientists that have practical value and or industrial use. Technical methods in a particular area of industry or art. Technical means and skills characteristic of a particular civilization, group, or period. My talk this evening covers 50 of my years in cricket photography from the 60s to the millennium. I started my journey at the then Barbados Advocate using a camera called Big Bertha. No doubt so called because it was big like the German gun also called Big Bertha. When one covered a match at Kensington Oval with Big Bertha because of its size and weight, it was left at the Oval for the duration of the match. Now, in those days, let me tell you that a test match in Barbados lasted at least six days, not including the off day, because the hours were changed. So instead of five, six hours days, we had about six, five hour days, including the, including the, um, the off day. So imagine covering cricket at Kensington Oval and leaving that camera under, under the table for the duration of, of, of the match. In other words, the camera was so big, no one wanted it, so it, it's easy to leave it there. Yes, my friends, it was left under the table and collected the next day, and this process obtained until the end of the match. Big Bertha did not provide one with mobility to change positions, and all photographs were taken from upstairs the then Pickwick Pavilion day after day. Coverage of cricket, in those days was restricted to the toss, the captains leading out their teams, and of course, the opening batsman. So in other words, the Big Bertha was there for the action, as we know it, limited as it was, and uh, the rolly cord was there, a twin lens reflex, we used that there so to photograph the team to make sure we get some pictures we photograph the teams coming out, being led by the captains, make sure you get the opening bats, and uh, of course, the toss. That was very, very important. Equipment in those days consisted of the rolly cord, which was a twin lens reflex, and the Nikon, which were single lens reflex. Cameras were all manually operated, and yes, you could only shoot one frame at a time. Strange enough, today is different, but you actually had to shoot and wind the shutter and then shoot and wind, shoot and wind, shoot and wind. Nowadays you shoot, and if you keep your hand on the shutter, you could shoot up to about four, up, up to about 10, 20 frames in one second. Marvelous. The darkroom equipment necessary in those days consisted of an enlarger, development tanks and timers. Chemistry was developer and fixer. The photographic paper came in different grades to allow good quality, but the end result depending, depended on the quality of the negative produced. And utmost care had to be taken in achieving a good negative. A glazing machine allowed for high gloss of photos. Um, just to, talk a little of the, the process of developing the negatives. One had to mix the chemicals and the, the, um, the developer that we use for processing the film, what we would normally do is to use it over and over again until it got weak. But I found that this uh, a little bothersome because when you got two or three people working in the same dark room, and I use it fresh, and don't put a mark that X film has been developed in that, then you get problems. So what we used to do is to dilute it, mix the solution one to one, and uh, process longer. And of course, you had to use the thermometer to get the temperature down to 68 degrees plus or minus a half degree. Uh, and that there gave you optimum. In other words, all the time, your negative should look the same way. So, 
That is one of the tricks in the trade that we developed over, over the years. The 70s presented the most challenges of my career in photography. It was in 1971 that it took the bold step, as Harkley um, just mentioned, to open Brooks Latouche Photography, partnership, partnership with um, Cyprian Latouche Jr. Within two years saw the birth of the nation newspaper. And as I was involved in a startup, I took on the task of photography for the paper. You may ask, what does this have to do with technology? Let me explain. As the nation was a weekend only paper at the time, and given that it was not the sole newspaper in Barbados, the intention was to give readers of the paper a freshness in appearance and also content. My challenge, therefore, was to cover cricket differently from what obtained in the 60s. Improve photographic equipment and action were the order of the day. And so I purchased a Nikon camera with interchangeable lenses. This allowed me the flexibility of shooting the action from different locations. Outfitted with the camera and the 300 mm lens, there was a freshness in cricket photography and readers were able to see their favorite players in action on the field, a far cry from what obtained in the Big Bertha days. Uh, just let me explain there again. In Big Bertha, big as it was, loaded on a tripod, shooting from one area all the time. The pictures, all the pictures look the same. You either get the action from that wicket, the far wicket, or the action from the close wicket and the focusing was extremely difficult. Later on, I will show you what we had to do with that. Um, in other words, when you focus, we had to make a mark. This is the wicket, the far wicket, and then when we focus again, we put another mark. This is the close wicket, and that is the only time you focus. That is the beginning of the play. You may refocus at lunchtime or so. But as you can imagine, as the day processes and so forth, you get a little tired and you may put the focus instead of that wicket there, you put it wrong. And if you do that, although it's just a, a quarter inch out or so, picture out of focus. And this is why we back up by making sure we photograph the players, the toss and, and, and the like. Now, as I said, let me explain uh, this uh, as it, I'm sorry. The subtle changes in the technology saw cameras fitted with a motor drive, which allowed one to shoot up to five frames a second. One also had the choices of shooting manually, shutter priority, or aperture priority. Technology had come a long way since the 60s, when one had to decide the aperture opening and the shutter speed depending on the light at the time of the match. Let me explain that again. In those days, what we used was uh, what we call a Western light meter, something similar to what you would see the, um, the umpires using at towards close of play. You know, when it's get dark, they come with this meter and they read the light and say, well, it's too dark for play to go on. Uh, in those days, we had to measure the light um, to judge whether we didn't shoot at 500 par per second at F8 or 5.6, if it get darker, then you had to open up a little more or shut down your speed, you know, allow for that. So you move from 500 to 250 or so. But in this day with the, with the, um, with the different technology, you didn't have to do that. You just set it at what ASA you want and that day will give you your correct exposure. And uh, as I said, that, that's a, a luxury that we didn't have we didn't have in those days. The year was 1976 and the day of the general election day in Barbados. The nation was being printed in Trinidad and it was charged with the responsibility of producing the photos. I made an arrangement within my company, Brooks the Tooth Photography, for me to cover St. Thomas, the constituency of J.M.G. Tom Adams, Charles Hackett, who was employed with me at that time, now deceased. He was assigned to cover St. John, the constituency of Mr. Earl W. Barra. 
and Latouche, my partner, he was assigned to cover Christ Church, in particular the constituency of Harold Bray St. John. A rush day it turned out to be, but well planned. After leaving St. Thomas, I collected the film from Hackett and St. John, and Latouche met me at the airport with Hayes, where I boarded a waiting chartered aircraft to Trinidad. The film, yes, was processed aboard the aircraft. I used a changing bag, no dark room, but a changing bag. Photographers in the group would know what a changing bag is. You push your hand inside and you, you load up your film, take it out, pour in your chemicals, and the rest is history. And uh, when we got time, I did this here to expedite matters. So time we got down to Trinidad and the Express newspaper, the film was dry in their dark room and start printing. The 70s also saw the height of inter intercolonial cricket and the necessity to travel to the other islands of the Caribbean. I built up a strong and lasting relationship with photographers at the various newspapers whose dark room I had to use for developing. The final product was dispatched via quick pack or jet pack or via any reliable Barbadian who happened to be returning home Maybe one or two of you all might have had to take some photographs from me sometime in those days. Also during the 70s came a change in photographic paper from fiber-based to resin-coated. The fiber-based paper, uh, you actually had to wash and wash and wash with all the chemi chemistry to make sure then it doesn't stain or change its color. But with the resin-coated paper, that was easy. All you had to do was use a squeezy squeeze off the water, use a chamois, I think, and in two minutes or so, it dry. Leave it in the air and it dry by itself, and with a high gloss too. So that day, that, day um, that was easy, and then we didn't have to use then the glazing machine as we know it. I now come to the period of the 80s. Most of you in the audience, and I've got a photograph back there, would have witnessed that historic over by holding to boycott at Kensington Oval in 1981, which I was privileged to capture on film. The highlight of this period was the West Indies tour to England in 1984, which was my first experience in covering cricket outside the region. Harold Hoyt, then editor of The Nation, said he would send me with Tony Koja if we could guarantee pictures back for the sun, the sun. Now, just imagine. A match start in England on Thursday, and uh, Harold want pictures back by the Sunday. Not the Friday, not the Saturday, but by the Sunday. And even that was a big challenge. At that time, the nation had become a daily newspaper. The condition set by Harold was a major challenge which Tony and I accepted, and we set about to accomplish the mission. Contact was made with Adrian Murrell. Adrian is a, a long-standing friend of mine, used to come down to the West Indies to cover for his, uh, his company called uh, All Sport, and which is now owned, incidentally, by Getty. So if you see pictures on television or in newspaper, pictures by Getty. Um, Adrian, at first, was with All Sport, and Getty then bought out All Sport and retained Adrian services. Up to today, we're still very good friends and corresponding and so forth. But we made um, a range with, with, with um, Muriel, who in turn made contact with the chief photographer at the Birmingham Post and Mail for me to process and make my pictures. Having finished the pictures on the Thursday after the match, contact was, with, was made with Mr. Roach who I think at that day was working with either BA or, or BWIA, alerting him of the impending package of pictures for the nation. The photos were sent on Friday by Blue Star, which is a courier system operated by the trains in England. They made a flight on Saturday, and I telephoned the nation and advised Harold that our mission was accomplished. It was a long and tedious process, but I think the end result uh, was worth it because the, the Sunday sun then with all the pictures, pictures by Gordon Brooks' story by Tony Koja, 
you know, May the Sunday paper, although the match had started the Thursday, and the Sunday would have been Sunday would have been the Sunday would have been the off day. So you had Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. But we may we we were able to accomplish what we set out to do. The second test was at Lords. And now I entered the big league as far as equipment was concerned and would rub shoulders with international photographers with the latest equipment. Such equipment included cameras placed strategically upstairs the pavilion looking directly down the wicket and triggered by remote control. That system, remote control, but in truth and in fact, the camera up on the pavilion mounted looking down the wicket and the photographer over the other side, that day he had then what they call a transceiver, where he triggered here from his camera, it triggered the camera upstairs, and the only he had to do is at lunchtime, go and uh, retrieve the film, and uh, put back in another roll of film. So he would get photographs from ground level, and also looking down, especially if you get fantastic slip caches and so forth. Those were the that was the equipment used in those days. Unfortunately, I was only shooting from ground level. I didn't have the, I didn't have the luxury of that, that sort of equipment. And we get now to the equipment that I had to purchase. I then purchased a 600 millimeter lens. Now, I was shooting before with the 300 but now I move in the big lead to 600. And with the 600, I also had um, a, a 1.4 converter, which um, multiplied the focal length, which is 600 by 1.4. So I had, automatically I had 840 millimeter. And that day facilitated me with the big guns in Lords. And then when I did photography, let's say like in Australia and South Africa with those big guns, as opposed to the small guns in the, in, in the West Indies. After having got the 600 millimeter lens, obviously I had to use a tripod. Before I was using the 300 handheld and I could walk around and shoot, but with the 600, very big, I had to use a tripod. But it still did not uh, impede my, my mobility because I would move around from area to area rather than letting your photographs look one, one dimensional. The next, my next step, was to purchase a 35 millimeter portable enlarger, which allowed me to print my pictures at my ledger. Now, just let me explain that. There again, what I used to do if I go to Trinidad, I would use the Express Dark Room or the Garden Dark Room. Jamaica, I would use the, um, the Gleaner. Or in latter days, I would use the, the other newspaper and the in Guyana, I would use the Chronicle. But what, what that did is restricted me somewhat because you could imagine home, tongue, home drums beat first and they had to make their photographs and then I make mine. And all hours I would be there up in nine, 10 o'clock and the poor photographer wanted to go home. So what I did is I purchased my own enlarger, which meant that, that all dark room, all hotel bathrooms where I stayed around the world, the dark room became, the, sorry, the bathroom became my dark room. And I processed all of my pictures there. Yeah. And then when I left, the, dark, the bathroom was as clean and spotless as ever. And, uh, and it, it was a challenge, but the pictures would verify that, you know, I was successful. The next thing is because of the travel and the di difference in the, um, temp the difference in voltage in the different c countries, I had then to travel then, being a sh doing my own work, I had to travel then with a step down transformer, which you know, moved from 240 to 120, which my, all my equipment was. We now come to the 90s. It was during this period that I was exposed to technology as we know it. The nation had brokered a deal with AP, Associated Press, which allowed me to use their transmitting machine, a Lefax, 
The machine used a telephone dial-up system to the recipient AP, which would in turn transmit all my photographs to the nation. Now, for that, the Creek Pro Co was established, letting the letting AP sorry could use any of my photographs for their international services. This is good. In other words, what they did is that they, I transmitted my photographs to AP, Associated Press. They transmitted that there to the nation. So in that case, the nation was getting pictures, no, not three days hence, but up to date, the same day. And uh, for that, no charge, but they then were, were able then to use our photographs for their international services. And obviously, we can charge them. And I thought that there was a very, very, very good, very, very good arrangement. With the lifting of the apartheid system, I was given the opportunity to visit South Africa with the Barbados cricket team during 1993. There was no change in the actual processing of the pictures. In other words, I still travel with my portable enlarger, my developing tank, um, film, enough, enough, enough film, over 50 rows of film, uh, and then using the, the hotel bathroom to make my pictures. Now, we brokered a deal with FedEx from here. Uh, so they would allow me to leave my photograph at FedEx in South Africa, and they in turn would transmit them back to Barbados and uh, build the nation. In other words, they would do this and build the nation rather than I taking out my pocket and paying all the time. But I guess because of the apartheid system had just lifted, and this was a, a black team, Barbados team, visiting South Africa, um, believe you me, they were all the course. And uh, I was able to just let them know which hotels I was going to be at. And uh, having done that, they in turn, then I called the res respective um, country, whether it's the respective, you know, whether it was um, Johannesburg, Cape Town, um, Petersburg, or wherever, and uh, tell them I'm at Sasso Sasso Hotel, Holiday Inn, we, yeah, we were staying at Holiday Inn's row, and then they, I left the photographs at the desk, and they came, picked up, and transmitted. And uh, let me explain, that system worked quite good, because the same time, or then uh, Prime Minister, um, Erskine Sandiford, now Sir Erskine, he was in South Africa and visited the team, and I was able to get some photographs of him with the team. And uh, it is just a stroke of luck that the photographs with him and the cricket team arrived in Barbados the same day. I don't, most of you all may remember, the same day when he took sick and was in hospitalized in Trinidad. So got sick, in, got sick in and went to Trinidad, and uh, the photographs arrived the same day. So then the next day, paper pictures with Sandiford, Sir Erskine, in uh, South Africa, and he was sick, I think. And the, the nation did tell me that that day was a big boost for the newspaper. In other words, they figured that, well, the money that they spent on me going to the thing was well worth it. During 1995 tour to Australia, I was armed with my first Apple computer and Nikon scanner. You guessed correctly. I had to take a crash course in the use of this equipment. It was done at the nation, Sun Beach, as the service provider at the time. I was careful to write down verbatim each step and process and retain this document for my travels. My very first effort in Australia to contact Sun Beach was a disaster, a real failure. And after several attempts, and probably processing, pressing incorrect different keys, the screen went blank. 
Well, I assume the system had crashed and became rather anxious. Not sure if I wish then for the good old days of no computer. The next day, I visited the, ne the nearest Apple store only to find out that nothing was really wrong with the computer. The technician asked me what tasks I was trying to perform, and after explaining, he directed me to an internet cafe near the hotel. Um, what I was trying to do was contact Sun Beach from my hotel. In other words, whatever the number was, one, two, four, six, so on, so on, so on, so on. And I was trying that from my hotel and couldn't get through. And the technician did tell me, he said, well, Mr. Brooks, I am glad for your sake that you didn't get through. Why? He said, well, number one, you would have been paying overseas calls. And number two, the pictures would have been going so slowly that the bill at the end of your day, you had the, the telephone calls for transmitting your pictures, if you had gotten through, would probably be more than what you'd be paying to stay. So he directed me to an um, uh, internet cafe quite near to the hotel. They reconfigured my machine to their system, and uh, everything from then moved quite, 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 uh, quite smoothly, to the extent then that I used their system throughout the tour. From that, that first test was in um, Brisbane, and then I went to Sydney, Adelaide, Perth, Melbourne, and I used their system throughout uh, with, no, with no further hitches or anything. So, In those days, there again, um, my challenge was we were using, now we're using color. So you had to look then for one hour labs throughout the country, which I was fortunate to find very near hotels, very near the hotels. Um, but then after that, yeah, so it became a little cumbersome. So there again, I went then and I was able then to process my own, my own color film. Enter the millennium and the age of dig digital photographic technology as we know it today. I decided out of caution and based on my recent encounter with the Apple computer to allow the technology to settle. My equipment comprised of a digital camera with computer, which obviated the need to be laid on down with film, a larger photographic paper, developing tank, and a processing solution. What a relief. Um, just uh, for photographers, I see my good friend Johnson in the, in the audience. In those days, the film speed was 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, and if you're lucky, you may get 3200, but then you have to get that from overseas. Uh, so in other words, if you were shooting at 400 and it get darker and you want to use the 800 film, then you're gonna take out that and put in the eight. If it get too dark and you want to use the, six, the 1600, you're gonna take out that film also and uh, put in. So all of these different size and different um, film that you had to travel with. Today's technology, you just shift the button on the camera from the, what they call now the ISO, which is International Standard Organization, as opposed to ASA, which was American Standard Association. But both is the same, they, they mean the same thing. But the beauty in today's camera is you just shift your button, the ISO to 400, 1600, 700, 7000, and it goes, believe you me, up to 51,200. So you don't have, and that, all of that is on the camera, and you don't have to have this sort of film and that film and so forth. And that to me was a, a, a real relief. And the cameras, as I said, autofocus. Um, the major feature, really, of the camera, camera cameras is the autofocus tracking, which allows the photographer to constantly keep the subject in focus as opposed to manual focus. 
in the early days, you actually had to focus manually and then shoot and probably wine, shoot and wine. Then as I said, up came then the motor drive, which allowed you then to shoot at least five, five frames a second. And you didn't have to wind the, that they that they wound, wound the film and did everything one time, which was a relief. Uh, but with these cameras now, and also with the the camera is has uh, what we call a memory card, which could hold hundreds and hundreds of pictures. After which, all you need to do is to download the images onto your computer, and uh, send them off to the newspaper or wherever you want to send them, uh, as opposed to film developing thing. Uh, as I'm on that subject, I'll explain, I'll give you a, a little story of what happened in that famous match in Trinidad when um, Ambrose actually ran through England and bowled them out for 40-something. Adrian Murray, who I alluded to earlier, he was sitting next to me and as eight wickets fell on that evening, Adrian went through at least eight rolls of film. Because every time a wicket fell, he had his runner and he telephoned, come go with that. And before the runner could get back to the um, depressed box to process, he had to run it back again, another roll, another roll, because the wickets were falling like this all the time. I, well, I had the luxury of using the same film because I was not in that hurry, but being he is shooting for overseas, overseas media and so forth, he had to be up, up to date all the time. So he went through about at least eight rows of film. Today, the same memory card would have taken all those photographs. He would be able to sit on his computer and as soon as one then, dip, dip, transmit that. And don't miss one. And that is the beauty in the technology today. In closing, let me go through the changes in uh, photographic technology over those 50 years, as I recall them. From Big Bertha, which is the initial equipment, to the Nikon D500, with a 400 f 28 lens, which is the current one. Big Bertha, as I, as I recall, was a 4x5 speed graphic with a telephoto lens and adapted to hold two and a quarter by three and a quarter road film. Initially, the camera was outfitted with a 4x5 back. In other words, it held the, the film was four inches by five inches. Very cumbersome, but we was able to get a back then to hold roll film. The next camera was the Rolly Cord, which was a twin lens reflex. I will show you that there later on also. Um, in that day, you focus with its twin lens, so you focus through the top lens, and the, act, the photograph was taken actually through the second lens. After this there came the Nikon F2 with the 300 millimeter lens. The equipment just mentioned all required the use of darkroom facilities. The darkroom facilities consisted of the developing tank, chemistry, thermometer to test the temperature of the developer, and that temperature should be at least 68 degrees, so 68 degrees Fahrenheit, and as I said before, this is when we use the, the thermometer to actually make sure the temperature is right to get optimum quality. A timer was also used, in other words, if you're processing for, if you're processing for eight minutes, you can risk your watch, or anything, so you set, set it for eight minutes, and after eight minutes it go off, and, and that's that. So we had, to, we had to use that. Obviously, then uh, easel, the image being projected on the dark, on the, with the enlarger, then you use the, um, the easel if you want eight by 10, five by seven, or what size picture you want, you had to use the easel. Um, and uh, with the moving out of the, the, the dark room as we know it, then we use then the changing bag as I, as I alluded to earlier. The, the latest equipment of the D500, which is digital, fitted with a memory card, which removes the need for film. On completion of taking a photograph, the image is scanned to the computer and downloaded. Ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you, 
Now, having used manual and digital processes in photography, I must admit that nothing comes close to the feeling I first experienced in seeing an image emerge from a seemingly blank piece of paper to a photographic image of an actual person. That feeling still remains with me today. I mean, just to project something on the easel, on a piece of paper, you know the image is there, but you can't see it. And then having passed it through your developer, the image do so, and slowly and slowly and slowly. And that feeling remains with me today. So the technology is good, and it is very good, because were it not for this technology, obviously we would not have seen the Australians cheating. I now, having finished, I now invite you to, to view a short clip of some of the equipment that we used in those days with his tools. And during this period of time review, my grandson, Stefan, would assist me in this process. Thank you very much. This here was the, the camera. Next frame. Next one. This is the back, which held four, the film in the back then was four inches by five. But we never used that for, for cricket. Next one. Next one. Uh, what is it? Yeah. This is the back that held the four by five film, as we know it. And it held two pieces of film at a time. One here and one at the back. And uh, if memory served me right, what we had to do was obviously th those were mounted in the dark room. And um, having, shot, having shot the film, you take out the, this is the, the slide here. You take the slide out, uh, expose it, and then put it in. But when you put back in the slide, you had to make sure it, the knob was turned the different, the different direction to the other one, so not to mix them up. Very tedious, but you could easily then turn around and shoot two upon the same film. Next, next one. This is the, the back, which we, we got. And this, here held, this is one held in the, the film as we know it, two, two, and, two and a quarter by three and a quarter inches. So the film move from here, right here, below the, the slide there, so, and then shoot. And this here was the winder. So when you shoot, you actually had to be winding, shoot again, and wind and shoot again. Very tedious. Next one. Um, this is, uh, as you can see, uh, Korak T-Max 400 film. The 400 uh, represent the 400 SA film. All right? Go ahead. And that's the 4x5. And this is the very pan, 120. This is for the rolly cord or the 120 cameras. And this it would also be able to use with the same speed graphic back. Don't mind it. This is Mark 120. This here give you about, about nine exposures, if memory serves me right, with the two and a quarter, two by three and a quarter and about 12 exposures if it's two and a quarter square. Right, Hartley? Next one. This is the Rolly, this is the Rolly cord um, with the twin lanes. You actually look down from here to focus, and this is your focusing knob, and you, the image is in here and it reflects. So you see it on the ground glass through this image through this lens, but then when you ready to shoot, the photograph is recorded through the bottom lens. Twin lens. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, this is the Nikon F5 with the straight camera. That's the, the, um, that's the strap, and that's the lens. Well, lens is closed there, so, but this is where your lens will go, interchangeable lenses, so you could use from your
wide angle from fisheye to wide angle 18 millimeter, 20, 35, right away up to about 600 millimeter. And uh, good luck for us, the Nikons, um, they allow you, any Nikon you have today, could use any lens that you have today. It, you may have had the, the Nikon in the 60s. Any Nikon from those days, the same lenses today would be able to fit that same Nikon, which is very good. So you don't have to be changing bodies all the time because you change the lens. Next one. There again, the Nikon, a little improvement. Then you, you've got your back. You've got your back. Um, and uh, the back probably with a battery pack in it. That is good. This is the, uh, the you, you, everything you focus to here. You focus through here, and then you, your shutter will be somewhere around here. And that's it. You can see an image or what, what speed or shutter you, what speed or shutter you got. There again, you can see F, F, autofocus, all of the different little marks that you had. Next one. This will give an idea of 400 SA film, 200 SA film. Um, ultra, there's the computer kits, 4G, and there, and that's how the film look when it come out. This is 24 exposure, probably 35 millimeter, 400. But this also came that you could hold 36 exposures, which we primarily use for cricket. Um, the camera again with the back, back open, that's the back open to show the back and the film as we know it and your your image then that is this or oh, this is a bracket here so to use if you want to use a flash you could put the put the flash up there this is the development tank whereby there's the cover you load your film on the spools i'll show you spool next the spools go down in here, and then when you close here, you develop it inside, and you develop for, depending upon the strength of the developer, eight, 10 minutes, or what have you. Next one. These are the spools. This here would hold the 120 film. This will hold the 35 millimeter film. And that process is done in absolute darkness. Absolute darkness, no light at all, any light, the negative is spoiled. Uh, what we had to do initially um, to get a little practice, you would do it outside the dark room, but you would close your eyes. So as far as you're concerned, it was still dark. You close your eyes, and you, and you eventually then, you, having practice with your eyes closed, then when you go in the dark room, you could open, but inside dark, so it's the same thing, same thing. Next one. Uh, this is just to show you what we used to do. Having done, you see one, two, three, four, five, six frames, uh, six strips of six, which is 36, which is the whole film. What we did then was make what we call a contact sheet. Uh, contact sheet, and then we could say, well, print this one, or print that, or print that, and print that. So this is, the con this is what the contact sheet looked like, and then the marking for filing. So when you look back, I can say, well, this was done in 1982 or 84. This one is holding, or this one. And this is then the multi-contrast, the, the paper, very, very contrast. And then the Eichfeld uh, paper also in the boxes. That's how the paper look, the RC papers I spoke to you about. Next one. You may want to know what these are, these are tongues. As we know it, what happened is that you, you try to keep your hand as clean and as dry as possible because any little moisture in your hand when you touch the negative finger mark and the negative spoil. Um, so in processing, we would use this here with the ends rubber to take out the film, take out the, um, the picture, and wash it, and then pass it so your hand don't touch it at all. Next one. This is the motor drive, as I sp spoke to you about, which would fit on the back of the camera, 
with batteries in here and right up here. And then when you shoot the film, when you shoot your picture, that they wind the film one time and you could put it to continuous or single frame. Continuous, as long as you keep your, your hand on the shutter, it goes off non-stop. Or you could set it to a single frame and you just get one frame at a time. It just shoot one frame. But it obviated then you're manually shooting. Next one. Um, this is the, the battery pack as we know it. The battery pack with all the different settings that you could get back there, not too clear. And these are the contact points for the, um, for the camera. Next one. Uh, this is the Nikon scan, scanner. Uh, and this is the film strip, the film holder. So my negative will go in here and uh, clamp it down and then I will be able to take this here right through here and scan the image on then to the computer. This is where I fell down initially in Australia, trying then to call up Sun Beach from, uh, from the hotel. Next one. This is the latest in the technology. My son uses, he uses this camera here. This is the latest in the, in, in the, in the, in the technology, which is a, D, a D, D500, eh? a D500, which is digital 500, with the built-in battery pack and the motor drive. And uh, you shoot and in the back here, so allow you to see a picture, which in the, um, the former days, we didn't know whether the picture was good or not until we process that film. Today, when you shoot, press a button, you can see the picture there. It is no good or it's very good, and you know you got a good picture. But in those days, you had to wait until you actually process that film. Then to say, well, at least I got something. And sometimes when you did process, the film might have been blank because the, as Harclay would tell you, if you don't load the camera properly, then you're shooting, 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 the marks going up 20, 23, 24, but the film actually is not moving at all, and you're shooting from blank. And when you try to rewind, as happened to me on a couple of occasions, when you try to rewind, you realize it, it's, it, ain't, it ain't tight. But you're doubting yourself, and you're whining, you're whining, you're whining, you're whining, and still, and you eventually got to open, when you open, the film in the same place. No pictures for the whole day you shoot and that whole roll gone. Next one. And this, this is how it looks now. With the, the camera, D500, Nikon, and that's the, the lens, 400 as opposed to 600. But just as strong and certainly not as heavy as the 6. The technology here is much better, as I said, um, state of the art. All the features, tracking, auto, auto focus and auto focus tracking, which allow you to keep the subject in focus as it goes on. That way I got one or two photographs in the back there, so which we could sh I show you later, which is because of this, uh, this technology. Ah, oh, thank you very much. This, believe you me, is your humble servant at Lord's, at Lord's, with my 600, 600 uh, millimeter lens. Uh, and you, you could see the terror, and everything is on a tripod. And uh, you may wonder, why would you be at Lord's or any room suit? And let me explain. And it was good that I took the advice. Um, Patrick Eager, who was a, one of the best, if not the best, cricket photographer in the world, Patrick Eager, and that was in 84. So he told me I was at Birmingham for the first test, and he said to me, Gordon, I must tell you, um, the attire you have on now would not do for Lords. 
Lord's is fairly stuffy, you know. So I would advise you to at least wear a waistcoat, wear a blazer, or put on a suit or something so. Uh, because if you want to go in the pavilion, you see, this dress would not allow you. Uh, if you have on a suit or so, it is not guarantee, but you stand a better chance if you have one of that. So I took his advice. I put on all the pieces, <laughs> waistcoat and all. And he said to me, so Gordon, ah, I did tell you to put on, but I didn't tell you to overkill. <laughs> but let me tell you, at the end of that test match, Gordon Greenish, 200 not out. Larry Gomes, 90 odd not out. The West Indies won, chasing down 300 odd runs with time to spare. And uh, having put up my equipment, I went to, the, to the, uh, the pavilion, presented myself, showed him my press pass, and he didn't even ask me a question. Go right up, sir. Straight to the launch room, and uh, Patrick and myself were up there taking all the presentation pictures while all the other photograph all the other photographers not well clad were downstairs ladies and gentlemen thank you <laughs> so we are going to give gordon uh, maybe about 15 to 30 seconds to have a, a sip of water. Uh, five. And we are going to use about five seconds uh, to thank him again uh, for what he was able to condense a lot of material into a very short period of time. So we would thank him for that first. And now, I, I did indicate that we are only going to have one lecture this evening and no mini lectures. Uh, Gordon will come here and take your questions here. Uh, please make your way to the, the microphone. Uh, I don't think you have to worry about anybody in front of you, but you should start making your way there now. Um, yeah, but I, th I think the, the guys with the cameras would want to have it. So, um, are there any questions? You cannot ask yourself a question. <laughs> let, me ask, let, me, let me ask the first question, Mr. Brooks. Good to see you, by the way. I don't know if you remember me, but I remember you along Culmer Rockway because I lived in Flagstaff. Ah. Um, how, do you, how would you categorize people like me today? Um, who take pictures with um, the cell phone? Would, am I just a telephonist or, or a cameraman? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me put it this way. Everybody who writes a letter or could write a letter is not necessarily a journalist. Everybody who could write a letter is not necessarily a journalist. Similarly, everyone who could take a picture may not necessarily be a photographer. Having said that, the technology and all the trimmings doesn't change. The first thing you must do to be a good photographer, you must be able to see. And when I say see, you must be able to see different to other, and everybody sees differently. In other words, if we had to ask the whole group here now to go and photograph, let us say, the public buildings, you would get each person will photograph that differently because each person will see it differently. Whether it is shoot it early in the morning, late in the afternoon, or at night. Even if you say everyone go at 10 o'clock to photograph it, everyone would find a different angle. And that is the, that is the, 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 the beauty in, uh, in photography, being able to see uh, and record that there so instantly. But yes, lots of people, but that's how you start anyhow. I started with a, a box camera, read, read a lot, and um, you know, challenges come and challenges go, and then after shooting, and I must say that um, I, I must thank the nation, 
because were it not for the nation, honestly, um, I would probably, I don't think I would be at this stage today because the nation allowed me not only to do cricket around the world and uh, quote unquote become pretty well known, uh, but also other assignments uh, the nation allowed me to cover, like the hurricane in, in, in Dominica, you know, Sydney Allen coming to come in, uh, want to come to Barbados to overthrow, things like that, you know, you, you, and, you know, and challenges also. And as I said in the presentation, doing, photographing things differently to give the people a freshness. So to answer your question, Continue shooting with your with, with your with your digit with your with your camera. I got a cam I got a digit. I don't know what to take with this, honestly. But you know, it is it is good to know because the more you, you shoot, the better you become. And then who knows? You may aspire then to go further. Thank you very much for a very interesting oh, thank you and me. retrospective look at your craft. Um, you remind me of myself. I'm not a photographer. But I did have early days of going into my own dark room, which was a little room with a, with a cloth hanging over. And my developer, yeah. I had a Minota that was a par had parallax correction, that kind of thing. Very good. So you, you took me back. Yeah. But what I noticed as you, you were speaking, and, and you were identifying the, piece, the various cameras, mm -hmm. that there seemed to be an emphasis on Nikon. Yeah. Now, I'm not I'm supporting a particular brand, but I'm beginning to wonder mm -hmm. um, whether there was some bias and whether you could tell us about that bias. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I might have said, well, perhaps you could have tried a Canon X or a Leica or, yeah. or whatever it is, yeah. but, but, but why especially Nikon? I, that, that intrigues me. Yeah. Well, thanks for, thanks for that question. Simply put, the, we started with Canons, but we, sorry, we started with Nikons. We started with Nikons. And being, as I said, the Nikons allow you to, whichever lens you buy over the years, you could still stay with. So like they say, we, we, uh, we, we remained with Nikon, but the can, yeah, Canon, uh, the same guy I told you about Adrian, <coughs> Adrian Morel, he uses Canon. Most of the other photographers in England use this scan. And if you look, so there's no, in other words, there's no bias with me using Nikon as opposed, if I started with Canon, I mostly would, up to now, would probably still use the Canon. And if you look around, let us say, like in, um, at tennis, at tennis, when, you know, when they have the presentation, you could look and see that the Canons actually outnumber the Nikons. The Canon is the um, the brownish, the the whole the whole body and the lens is is um, brown beiges, while the Nikon is black, and you could look at tennis, look at football or anywhere so, and you could see Canons virtually outnumbering the Nikons. But there's no bias. I started with with, with, with Nikon, and I ended with Nikon. It's just let us say like some computers people start with um, Apple. And continue with Apple right away, rather than shift and so forth. And the, the 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 body is one thing, but the lens is what make the camera. And as long as you got a good lens, a, a ZS lens, or and all people can make bad lenses anyhow. But that was my preference, the, the Nikon, and I stuck with it. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. Mr. Brooks, I want to thank you for such an interesting presentation thank and you. sharing your perspective with us. I am always intrigued by persons who have reached the top of the field or excel in their field and often want to know, one, if you had to do anything differently in terms of your career, what would that be? And secondly, given the highs and lows of West Indies cricket, do you think at any time when we were starting, when we started sliding down the scale, did that have an impact on your enthusiasm in terms of photography, or did it impact you in any way as you went along? Yes, 
Like anything else, it impacted me. As a through West Indian, you've got feelings. Uh, it was painful, very, very, very painful uh, for me to see the West Indies, especially my first tour, not the Barbadian tour in, seven, in 93, but when they went to South Africa later, I think it was 96 or whenever it was, I mean, when the players had the little protests in England and we got, I think, about five love, that was painful. But like anything else, you know, <clears throat> you are a professional. You're a professional. And you still got to try to record what happened. Uh, and I'll give you an idea. That same tour, I remember, um, I, I think it was in Port Elizabeth, not Port Elizabeth, but uh, East London. And uh, I went over and I told Captain Lloyd, I'm running off. And Lloyd said to me, well, you got it up, man. you go long, man. But you got to stand and stomach this, a couple of explicits and so forth. You know, but that gave you, you know, but he was telling me, well, oh, you could go long, but you, you got to stop here and stomp what they say, you know, they say bad. And I was able also at the presentation function to get a photograph of Lloyd looking very despondent and Larry, the captain, also looking despondent. So in other words, what I'm saying is that although you're sad and so forth, you can't let your emotions stop you from seeing a picture. In other words, no sense in my photographing Lloyd looking jovial when I know he's sad, or photographing Lara laughing when I know he's sad. When I was able to maintain my composure and get that unique picture with both of them looking very, 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 very sad. Similarly, um, there's one, I don't have it here, but um, in the book, I've got one with Richardson, Hooper, and Lara. And they're actually propping on each other. And the caption was, uh, I, I think, trouble in the slips. With three, three, the biggest fellas in the cricket at that time, very despondent, all of them had bow and so forth. And uh, that caption was thing in the slips. Another one from that era also, although, that's what I'm saying, although you're sad, you photograph the sad ones. When they're good and jumping with high fives, you photograph that. Another one was Jimmy Adams. Remaining um, wicked stumbling all the time. And there was Jimmy Adams slump over his back. And I was able to get Jimmy and the sight screen. One man and the sight screen white. And this was one man there. And I told the nation this photograph do not crop it. It is not a pitch. It's not a use pitch. You don't have to use it tomorrow. You can use it anytime, but use it the same way with one man. And uh, I can't remember the caption, but you know, to the effect that you know, trouble, trouble, trouble all over the place, and this one man standing. So yes, it it, it affect you, but you got to go beyond that and uh, try to still be a professional. Yeah. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a follow-up to her question, actually. Um, when we were doing research for this series, we were looking at things that, um, like, like um, the way how conflict has affected cricket, you know, things like apartheid and so on. Yeah. And you mentioned you traveled to South Africa. Yeah. Um, did you strictly stick to just the sporting shots, or did you capture some of those contentious historical moments as well. And if you did, could you share a little bit of that with us? Yeah, there is one in 90, when we were first went in 93, uh, I think it was in, jo yeah, it was in Johannesburg towards the end. Uh, and uh, what struck me, and the nation used it, the nation did use it. I must research that and, uh, and get a copy and show you. Uh, but we were in this, I went in this village and uh, as I was in the village, looking to the right was a middle class housing. And believe you me, there was a road, and to the left was slums. Slum, uh, honestly. I, I mean, and it, it, you know, it, it started tearing at my heart. So I photographed that, and I turned around and I photographed the slums, and uh, Harold used it 
And uh, I think, I'm under correction, but I think there was a sign saying whatever happened. And that we're showing the two, the two words. Um, following up from that, in the same, the same uh, 93, 93 tour, I wanted to, we were all due to come back to Miami. I had some friends in, um, in New York whom I wanted to visit. And uh, I just, I, went, I called uh, South African Airways and I asked them if I could be rerouted to New York as opposed to like, leave a couple of days early rather than a thing. And he said, okay, fine. And I asked him if the fee, there again, apartheid just lifted. No fee, no fee for changing my ticket. <laughs> um, and they told me the only thing is to go down to Wonders and uh, the agent for them, the cricket agent for them is, um, I can't remember the name of the travel agent. They will come back, it will age takes its toll, of course. Um, if you go down to them, you know, they would direct you, they would change your ticket and everything. So I went to Wonders, I saw this, I went in and I saw this guy, and um, I told him I want to, Remy's travel. I want to see Remy's travel. And he said, uh, if you go back downstairs, just walk around the building, uh, underneath there, so uh, you will see Remy's travel. So I did that, uh, went wrong with my taxi, and uh, obviously all the people I saw, I was asking for Remy's travel. And after asking about four people, white people of course, no one knew where Remy's travel was, so I retraced my steps. I went back upstairs to ask him, and I saw then a couple leaving, coming through, and I asked them, a white couple, of, obviously, and when I asked them, they said, oh, Remy's travel, just walk here, so go down the stairs. If you go down the stairs, you will see Remy's travel. I said, but, and the same guard was coming. I said, but you sent me all wrong there just now. Well, it's true, and he said, with tongue in cheek, he said, oh, I was trying to save you that walk. But now, when I actually was going through the pavilion, when I was going through the pavilion, I realized why he was sending me around. Because this here was, if you could imagine, let us say, like the Bridgetown Club in those days, upstairs, having lunch, and the place is full. When I say full, I mean full, with people having lunch. And this one black man walking through there. That there was it. So he was sending me around the building as opposed to walking in the back. And I walk in the back, I got, that, got my ticket change at no cost and so forth. So that I remember. That I remember. Apartheid system being, being lifted. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it wasn't easy. Uh, good night. Good night, Dad. Um, as a follow-up to the question that was asked about South Africa, mm -hmm. I remember there was a photograph of two children playing on the field, one black and one white. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Can you... Um, explain that to the audience, please. Yeah, that, that was one. I, there again, um, as you said, Mary, as you were, you were intimating, you're there for cricket, but you still got to see other things. And, uh, and that was in 1993 also with the Barbados team. And I was able to, to get from school, obviously, a, a black child and a white child in the Blazers, probably went to the same school and they were playing together and so forth, jovial as, as like. But as we know it, at school is one thing, is when you leave school and you enter work, that you, uh, you'll get these prejudices and so forth. But at school, no problem at all. But yes, yes, Randy, thanks for reminding me. But that tour, what I did, I looked at, I remember a photograph also, I, I don't know, it wasn't the 93, when I went back, I think this year was, this year probably was at Port Elizabeth, either Port Elizabeth or East London. And I was able to get in the distance some workers actually sweeping and so forth. And that did to me, you know, was, I just wanted to tell the, tell the story of apartheid lift, lifted and uh, how people are getting on. You go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask you if um, you got any pictures with um, 
Dennis Atkinson and Clement de Pisa when they broke the record? 319 uh, it was? No, unfortunately, um, it, unfortunately, that was in 1955. I had just left school and went straight to the nation. So I was in the stereotype department. Okay. And even if we had any photographs from that era, they would have been probably taken by the same Big Birth that might have mm -hmm. been, as I said. I can't remember seeing any. But I could tell you that even if there were, there wouldn't be any today. Okay. Because the advocate, as we understand, they did really, really terrible thing. All of their records and so forth, they destroyed have, when they left Broad, Broad Street okay. to go to Fond du Bell. So even if there were pictures in those days, gone. Okay. Gone. All right. And that's bad. Really sad, you know. But I've got a, a reasonably good collection of my photographs from in the 70s with um, Shell Shield, and then Red Stripe, and then the uh, International Cricket. And uh, with, the, with the help of my son with the computer and so forth, most of those negatives could be scanned and brought back to life, you know, that's it. I wanted to share as we, go ahead, George, go ahead, John. Just a simple question, Gordon. No question is simple. <laughs> <laughs> this is very simple, but difficult to answer. Yeah. You've taken many, 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 many outstanding cricket photographs. Yeah. Of which one are you the proudest? Which one? Of which photograph are you the proudest? I think the, the one really would be holding bowling boycott. I mean, yes. seriously, you can't, you can't miss that. But there is one that I did in um, Dominica, and it was not even on assignment. I was down there jogging around. And I was in a position to get, I can't remember, it was Desmond Haynes being caught. And the, the guy is actually parallel to the ground. Uh, it just happened to be at the right time, you know, handheld camera, at the right time, the right place. But definitely the one we're holding, uh, holding being, being, um, being bold. Because practically everybody who was at Kensington that day or even if they weren't there and heard about it, they would, uh, they, would remember, they would remember that picture. Actually, Boycott said that was the greatest, the best over he ever faced in his yeah, whole career. Easily. Six balls, miss all six, the six one hit the stumps. Yeah. Boycott out. And I wondered if you could tell the audience, how do you have such intuition? I remember, and just for the sake of the audience, Gordon and I go back a long time. Actually, Very long, was, yeah. Gordon's partner, Latouche, his father developed the first color photograph that I did yep. at school in 1959. It was yep. a fourth right. form at Harrison College. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. And I've been friendly with the group for the whole time. Yeah. But I remember a photograph you took of a stumping at Kensington Oval. Mm -hmm. And how you did it, I don't know. There was a wicket keeper taking the bills off and the batsman with his foot just an inch mm -hmm. off right. to the ground. Yeah. And it had to be done in a split second. Yeah. And you've done this many, many other times. Yeah, well, it's, so I don't know how you did it. it it's, uh, it's concentrated, number one. And, and seriously, you know, people don't understand, but you've got to really concentrate. And uh, when I take in pictures, you can't offer me a drink. No, seriously, you can't offer me a drink. I'll tell the audience no, this once I. I, I, I will drink later. I drink, oh yeah, definitely, but not when I take it, no, not when it's working, not one. You can't smell it. If you smell it, it's probably the night before. <laughs> but it's not during the day. Maybe yes. not. Very, very, very serious. And the other day again, you're representing not only yourself, you're representing Brooks the Tooth, but you're representing Barbados, and by extension, the West Indies. And you're overseas, and you, oh no, 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 that, that is, that's a no-no. Ah, -no. Uh, seriously, very no-no. Not me. Yeah. No, I just was going to tell the audience one other story I had with Gordon. I, as a keen amateur, was actually next to him at Kensington Oval, and we were watching Malcolm Martin. He turned and he said, Johnny, hold on, a wicket coming up, a wicket coming up. Yeah. 
<laughs> intuition. Yeah, gotta get this photograph. Intuition. You just yes. feel it sometimes. And he has that intuition that yeah, I don't understand. You feel it sometimes. It's been great yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, George. Let me leave. This, and this is really sweet. At the same 84 Lords. Now, imagine Lords, as they say, very stuffy. Six photographers here. Position B, another six. Square is 12. On this pavilion is 10. Back the nursery end. Upstairs, you can hold about 12. Downstairs, you go all, all positions. And my position was upstairs at the nursery end. Hence the photograph. That's upstairs at the nursery end. Uh, the pavilion is over the other side. And uh, I realized by tea time that the rest are going to win this match. And if I want photographs, I'm going to move from there to go over to the pavilion end because when the runs are scored, the feet, everybody's going to rush onto the field, the player's going to rush in, and if I'm upstairs, I could look down and get my good picture. So I move at tea time, and I went upstairs. Now, there again, we had an understanding among the photographers that as long as any position is not fully subscribed, anyone could go there. So in other words, if it's the whole five photographers, six photographers, and only two is there, then I could go. No questions. But if then the others come, well, then I got to leave. So I went upstairs on the pavilion end. And this guard, uh, excuse me, let me see your pass. So I said, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but that was the nursery end. I said, I know that. But this position, he said, but you've got to go back to the nursery end. You can't. Come. I said, but this is not fully subscribed. And as long as I try to tell him, he ain't, and up comes the chief guard. Oh, uh, excuse me, sir, it seems as though you have a problem here. I said, no, I ain't got no problem. He had a problem. <laughs> he had a problem, not me. He said, let me see your pass. He said, but this is the nursery end. I said, but Skipper, I told you I know it's the nursery end, but this position is not fully subscribed. And he looked at me and he said, well, it seems as though I got to assert my authority here. <laughs> Knock his heels and his, so I left. Because next thing you know, you would probably arrest me or something. So on. I went back downstairs. I don't remember the same Adrian Murray who I alluded to. He said, Gordon, you don't look right. I said, man, the guard upstairs, don't give me trouble. He said, man, let's come, come, come with me. Let me get this extra note, man. Because by then, the England, they don't believe that the rest would won. So the English photographer is gone. And the place is empty. And I said, no, no, you, you don't worry. Let me, I just stay downstairs. Don't worry to go upstairs. And I remain downstairs. But I will never forget that. He knocked his, you know, I'm sorry, it seems as though I got to assert my authority here. So we are at the tail end of, of my, my responsibility. Um, I, I, would, I would wish before I do the sort of formal closing uh, that, that you would encourage the museum and, and other folks who have uh, the, the ability to arrange to have uh, practitioners speak uh, uh, to continue to afford practitioners a platform to speak. Uh, the whole business of um, practice as research and research as practice is something that I think we could all benefit tremendously from. And Gordon's talk to us this evening is a good example of that. So Gordon, thanks once again. Uh, I'm asked to indicate to you that the 2018 lecture series is hosted by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the University of the West Indies Department of History and Philosophy, and the National Cultural Foundation. I'm also asked to remind you that the women's cricket in the Caribbean 
will be the topic of the next presentation, which will be given by Margaret Broom, uh, next Brooms, sorry, next, next Tuesday. I think the only thing left for me to do now is to thank you for being here and uh, to ask you to encourage your friends and neighbors and maybe a couple of your enemies to join us when we do this next. Uh, please join us in the foyer for a beverage. Um, I, I think there's something for you too. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>